All right, so let's get started. So, yeah, like get it done soon. This is the only thing between us and the long weekend right now. So, um, last class we covered Bayesian learning. Um, we said that for Bayesian learning, there are two things that we need to specify. We need to specify the data model, or what we often call the likelihood, and we need to specify a prior. So there are two models that you need to come up with. For the coin, it's very easy. For the coin, it's just a Bernoulli and a beta distribution. Um, later, we will come up with more interesting data models like neural networks and random forests, um, things that are sort of very popular out there and that can actually be used to do a lot of very cool stuff. <coughs> now, with, with the Bernoulli distribution, we know the Bernoulli by now. We've seen it many times. It's just the probability of a coin flip. If we have many coin flips, the coin flips are independent, so we just multiply all the individual Bernoulli distributions. Um, we introduced this um, beta prior and the beta prior uh, distribution and in fact instead of showing you this I will show you one of the best resources for learning about the beta prior Wikipedia um, where so the beta prior essentially is a distribution over um, theta Okay. And theta is the probability of x equal 1. So in this graph, Wikipedia is using x. So um, x is the variable here. But in, in my slides, theta is the variable on which we bring the beta prior. Um, the main thing is we have theta, the variable that's equal to the probability of x equal 1, the probability that the coin will be 1. And that's true for any coin, so any for the ith coin. Um, and then what we're doing is we're putting a prior on theta. We're putting a distribution on theta, which means that we're putting a distribution on a distribution that the coin will be equal to 1. And that's because if I ask you what's the probability that uh, the bridge will collapse, um, many of you have different estimates for that probability. So probabilities themselves are subjective. And so we put priors on that. <coughs> now, a probability is between 0 and 1. So theta, because it's a probability, it must be between 0 and 1. So when I specify a probability, it must be that that probability only takes value where theta is between 0 and 1. And so the beta distribution, as you can see, it starts at 0, it ends at 1. It's a curve, it's a bump. Uh, when I use the, a particular setting of the hyperparameters, I get a uniform distribution. But by manipulating those hyperparameters alpha and beta, I can change the shape. And I change the shape to indicate what are my prior beliefs. Um, someone at the end of the class was worried that this curve is higher than one sometimes. That's OK. Um, so um, the important thing is that when we do um, probability, You may have a curve that goes over 0 and 1. So you might have something, say, that has height 2. And this is still a valid uh, distribution because this is what we call the density. And that's what we are uh, plotting there, the probability density. The area under the curve. is 1 because the integral of p of theta, d theta between 0 and 1 
is equal to 1. Okay? Probability is the area under the curve of a density in continuous uh, model. And just like we did for discrete variables, you can also get the cumulative and so on. And the reason why we do this is because we can only assign um, probabilities to intervals. So if you take a little interval, you, you want to know what's the probability that theta is between uh, in this interval, um, you just evaluate this area. And that will give you the probability of being in this. Okay, so we can say pick the height of this and we, we're going to call it P of theta. This interval is a delta theta. And so typically what we say is that the probability of the random variable theta being in the interval delta theta is equal to the height times the width. Sort of loosely speaking, because obviously you have to take limits here. Uh, but essentially, uh, a, a probability is a density times uh, something that you can measure, a length or an area. And, and this is mainly because the probability of hitting a continuous point uh, is zero. My projector has just turned off for five minutes, despite the fact. Oh, fortunately not. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so that's basically probability and density. So you can have the density going above two. The, the, the important thing of probability is the area under the curve of the density. Oh, one more thing. If you look at the beta distribution here, it will tell you everything you need to know about the beta distribution. It tells you what the mean is, so you can read the mean, um, you can read the median. Um, the mode is the peak, where is the highest point. Um, the variance is how wide that distribution is. So we're going to look at all, all of these now with an example. Um, importantly, the mean is just alpha over, over alpha plus beta. Okay. Um, so, as I just pointed out, it's one possible less. Now, for a bit, uh, frequentists use what people call point estimates. They believe in a single truth, one value of theta. So it's the number of ones divided by the number of coin flips. That's theta. It's a single number. Um, Bayesians don't think like frequentists. Um, Bayesians instead try to return a whole probability. The answer is a probability, it's not just a single value. Okay, so a Bayesian will say the answer is this posterior distribution. And if you need to summarize it, you can use different ways of summarizing it. You can use the mean, you can use the mode, which is the location of the peak, or you can use its variance. Now, why is that useful? That is useful because, um, you know, suppose I tell him, you know, the probability that you have cancer is 0 0.9 plus or minus 1. Okay. That you might, may or may not have cancer. But if I tell him the probability that you have cancer is 0.9 plus or minus 0.001, he has a problem, right? And so knowing the confidence of your prediction, of your parameters, is actually very important. It's not just whether theta is 0.9, but it's how confident you are that that's the right uh, value. And, and that, in fact, knowing how confident you are is actually the most important thing in a lot of applications. Like certainly when you deal with stocks and you need to estimate um, like the variance in the market is way more important than just knowing, um, say, 
what an exchange rate is. Because once you know the variance, you know how much risk and you know how to gamble in the market. Okay, and so how do we compute it? Um, we use the trick that we know the integral of a distribution. Um, the, the big trick that we're going to use is that the integral of the posterior with respect to theta is 1. Okay, the, the posterior is the distribution of the theta. If we sum over theta, we get 1. And then using the definition of um, beta distribution, that immediately tells us what the constant of proportionality is. What is the normalization constant makes this probability sum to 1? And so if we know that, when we do the derivation, we don't need to worry about constants. So we simply write the likelihood times the prior. I drop all the constants and I just use the proportional symbol. Okay. The moment I use proportional, I can drop all the constants. I replace equality by proportionality proportionality. I complete squares. I just basically use the rule that x to the a times x to the b is equal to x a plus b. And now I just look at the shape. The, the sh you know, the shape of this distribution is like a beta. And I accept that now there's a new alpha. Um, <coughs> which I call alpha prime, which is m plus alpha. And there's a new beta, which I call beta prime, which is n minus m plus beta. So the new alphas and the new betas, the prime ones, um, they also depend on how many counts you had of zeros and ones. Um, but because the shape looks like a beta distribution, I do know what its constant of proportionality is. So I can go back here. And I can just replace the constant by the thing that makes this sum to 1, that makes this area under the curve be 1. Okay, so you don't need to know how to do that integral in order to be able to do to compute the posterior because you just use this known result. So like in the midterm, I would give you this. I would tell you this is the normalizing constant. So you wouldn't need to solve the integral because you would know what the integral is equal to. Okay. And in particular, what I'm saying here is that the integral of theta to the alpha prime minus 1 times 1 minus theta to the beta prime minus 1 between 0 and 1 <coughs> d theta is equal to gamma alpha prime gamma beta prime divided by gamma of the sum. So if, we, if given that known result, we know what constant to put there to make sure that it sums to 1. So once we have the posterior, um, we're done. Okay. So here is an example of what you can do. Um, suppose that you start by believing um, that your prior is a beta distribution 1, 1. In other words, alpha is equal to 1 and beta is equal to 1. If we plot that distribution, we have a uniform <coughs> distribution between 0 and 1. Okay, so that's your p of theta. But now, let's assume that as time goes by, you observe the first coin flip, 1. <coughs> Now, your posterior, given the new coin flip, is equal to a beta. And then alpha prime just gets added 1. So 2 comma 1. Okay? Because essentially alpha prime is just the number of 1s plus alpha. And nothing has happened uh, with beta. Oh, sorry, beta also changed because we've added um, 
so sorry, it has changed, but it hasn't because you, you've added a one, but then you subtract a one, so you're just adding a zero. So beta stays the way it was. And now the mean, which, we, which is the expectation of theta given x1, It's 2 over 2 plus 1. And we can plot this again. So the mean is 2 thirds. And if we plot this as a function of theta, we'll have a curve now that kind of looks something like this. So now you believe that it's more likely, it's more probable that the probability of this coin being a 1 is 1 than uh, before. Now let's assume that you observe <coughs> x2 equal 1, then, then the new distribution will become a beta 3, 1. And let's call this the mean <coughs> theta bar, with theta bar is now equal to 3 over 4. So the mean is moved to the right. And if you keep observing once, the mean keeps moving to the right. So now, if we were to plot theta and p of theta given <coughs> x1 to 3, we probably would have something that's much more peaked on 1. Beta still 1? Pardon? Oh, that's correct. So beta is n minus m plus beta. But n is the number of, um, let's say after the first one, n is equal to 1, and m is equal to 1 plus beta. So that's just equal to beta. So beta is not changing n minus m is always 0 because m is 1. And even at three steps, n is equal to 3, m is equal to 3, so they cancel. But la now let's say that x4 and x5 and x6 are all equal to 0. So then, we would have a beta distribution with um, 4 comma 4. And you can just check. It's just adding counts, essentially. All we're doing is incrementally adding counts either to zeros or to ones. And the 4 comma 4 distribution now will have mean that is Um, 4 divided by 8, which is equal to a half. And it looks something like this. Okay, so with a peak at the half. Okay. And does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense because it's basically saying if you've seen three zeros and three ones, it's most likely that this is an unbiased coin, that the probability of um, one is actually 0.5, okay. which makes perfect sense. If you observe a million zeros and a million ones, then this is basically going to peak at the half. So it's basically telling you the coin is fair. If you observe a million ones, it's going to peak at one, which tells you the coin is biased. So um, is, there, is there any other way to get the uniform distribution other than one one? Pardon? Is there any other way to generate the uniform distribution 
than with the beta parameters other than when alpha and beta are one? Because uh, those are the settings. The beginning, it's uniform because you have like almost no information, just two flows. Right. So and as soon as you do anything after that, you can never get back to uniform. I guess. That is correct. You would have to change your model if you actually believe that you should be able to get back to uniform. It's possible, but you would have to change the model. We wouldn't use a beta, but we might use, say, a mixture of beta distributions or actually a mixture or a beta. With this current model, this current model has that deficiency, if you will, that once you move away from the uniform, it's very hard to get back to it. Because as you get, because essentially as you get knowledge, you you, you shouldn't be able, but I mean, in this model. In this model, it's impossible to describe what you want to describe. So this model so also doesn't describe the order that you're, that you're giving. Um, That's correct. In this model, order also doesn't matter. Okay, because it just counts. If I had seen uh, three zeros before I saw the three ones, um, after six steps, I would have had the same distribution. So order doesn't matter. Okay. But again, don't take that as a, that ends up not being a very yeah. harsh criticism on this. Yeah. So, because you can always change the model. <laughs> so that if you believe that the posterior should indeed be able to be uniform again, you would use a different model. Well, in this, in this case, it doesn't make sense, really, because the coin is a, we're saying it, it has, or if we make the assumption, it has a parameter that, and the uniform distribution is any parameter is just as good as any other mm -hmm. parameter. And as you flip, if you can't get back to the uniform, you're, it means that with <coughs> you learn things. And you yes. get closer to something, which is yeah. fine. But having said that, so this is fine. I, I agree. But having said that, it's important to, this model does have this deficiency, though. That once you've been learning, you might not want to. You might have a, a problem for which you do want to go back to the uniform distribution. And for that, we will learn other distributions. But we're not there yet. OK. So that's Bayesian learning. Now, I'm showing you the mean. But some people also report the mode, which is the location of the peak. So the, the theta mode <coughs> is equal to alpha minus 1 over alpha plus beta. I believe it's minus 2. Don't quote me on this, even though I've put it on the slides. This is what I usually do when I'm not sure. There you go. Where's the location of the mode? The mode, yes. Alpha minus 1 over alpha plus beta minus 2. So I got that one right. Okay. These are different estimates. And you also have an expression for the variance, which you can just read it off the Wikipedia page. And the variance tells you how certain you are in that value of theta. But ultimately, the answer is a full distribution. And then you just give summaries of the distribution to the end user. OK, now let's see how do we apply to this to something a bit more interesting than coins. Oops. So as I told you earlier, uh, going to graphical models, no matter how big these graphical models is, um, if you're dealing with binary variables, you just need to do to flip coins. You just need a coin model in order to be able to learn the parameters. Um, and I'm going to illustrate that with an example today. I'm going to do it, do it two ways. I'm going to do it by a maximum likelihood first, and then we're going to do the Bayesian way. Okay? And so since it's Friday, I just cooked this example an hour ago. Um, okay, so. <laughs> The variables here is whether you go and drink martinis and end up at Fritz downtown. Who's been to Fritz? See how <laughs> only three people went to Fritz. 
<laughs> that dodgy place on Davy Street that sells <laughs> <laughs> fries dripping in oil. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then another variable is whether you stay home studying, which I guess is what most of you are doing. So kudos to you. <laughs> and, um, and, then, and then the last variable is whether you get thin as the result. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that we, instead of drawing a model and telling you what the tables are, what's the probability of threats given drunkenness, etc. cetera, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down variables, M, F, S, and T. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to conduct a little study. I basically monitor each of you over three weekends and, and, and then I write down the data. So I might say monitor him and he did go and drink a martini. He went to Fritz he didn't stay home and study, and he did not get very thin as a result. <laughs> okay? So who else wants to give me a data point? What would you do tonight? Come on, someone. Martini, yes? What about Fritz? No Fritz? <laughs> study? <laughs> yes? <laughs> <laughs> someone else, someone else. One more, a few more data points. I'll have a martini. I'll go to Fritz. Yeah. I'll not study. Yeah. And I'll have too much to drink, so I might throw up and get <laughs> <laughs> One more. I'll do all four. Martini, Fritz, study while drunk, and still get thin. Wow. <laughs> All right, so that's our data. And actually, just for good measure, because I have four by four, I kind of want to have five by four. Oh, one more. All zeros. Oh, I didn't do anything. I studied in a sort of pad. Yeah. <laughs> just lay around. Oh, you studied. studied. Oh, you, you didn't study, yeah. And you still got fat. Okay, good. <laughs> so I'm going to put that on the board here because we're going to need this. So M, F, S, T. And uh, we're going to go with. Uh, one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, zero, and finally one, one, zero. Okay, these are your observations with N equal five observations. Okay. Now I'm going to draw a graph describing all these variables and um, this time I'm going to pick the graph structure. Toward the end of the lecture I will tell you how you would go about picking out the graph structures and choosing what is the best graph structure. But my graph structure will be as follows. Uh, Martini often influences whether you go to Fritz, which often influences whether you um, get thin or not. And studying also influences whether you get thin or not. That's the graph that I'm going to use for the rest of uh, um, the, the class. You could draw other graphs. Yeah. And study. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> So you could consider putting an arrow here. But what we're going to do is we're going to try this graph and then you can try the other graph in your own time. And for both graphs you can compute the probability of the data given the graph and then you can pick which graph works best for you. Okay, so we will be able to choose a graph but for now we're just going to pick this graph. Okay, so we're going to 
Um, of course, this is a graph, so um, you know that there is a table here of two values, which is the probability of f given m. m is binary, so these are the probabilities. There's a p of s, p of m, p of f given m. And then finally, here we have a table with eight entries, which is the probability of being thin given study and Fritz. Okay. So that's our model. What we don't know is what should go inside those tables. We don't know the numbers inside those tables. But using the maximum likelihood or Bayesian learning, we will be able to fill in the tables. And once we fill in the tables, we can answer questions like, what's the probability that you're thin given that you had a martini? Or what's the probability that you had a martini given that you are studying right now? Okay. And that we will be able to answer all those queries and the, the answers that you get will be as good as the date at the end of the day. Okay, so, so these are our models. And um, another way to write this is to basically say P of Martini. Go ahead. How, how many graphs could you draw down? So um, an exponential more. number of graphs. Oh. So, so this is very hard. M model selection is very hard. I'll come to it at the end. Given the data, do we also perform learning about the structure of the graph? Pardon? The structure? Yes, so that's again the same question. I'll come to it at the end. Before we learn the structure, we need to know how to learn the parameters. Because learning the parameters is a subroutine in learning the structure. So for now, let's assume that this is the structure has been given. And the task is to learn the parameters. And let's first learn to do this properly. So I can model this as a, a Bernoulli variable with parameter theta. So I'm, let me actually bring it give myself some room. Okay. And I could say this is theta to the number of uh, times, actually let me use the following notation that might be a bit more clear. The number of times m is equal to 1 times 1 minus theta, the number of times <coughs> m is equal to 0. So it's just a Bernoulli. Okay, so the entry here is theta, the entry here is 1 minus theta. And this is 0, 1, um, and this is the variable m. <coughs> So for each of these variables, we will use a Bernoulli distribution to model them, because all the variables are binary. Likewise, I'm going to put, say, alpha, 1 minus alpha, and I'm going to write is um, alpha to the number of, I'm just going to put a t for times, number of times s equal 1 times 1 minus alpha, the number of times s equals 0. Okay? And now we get to the interesting ones, like this guy here. So I'm going to use a parameter, let's say beta, 1 minus beta, because this is a distribution of a, a t, and then basically we have the 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 case for S and F. And so, in particular, the probability of T given S equals 0 and F equals 0 is equal to beta. Let's put an index here because there are going to be four of these guys beta 1, 
times the number of times t was equal to 1 when s was equal to f equal to 0 times 1 minus beta 1 times the number of times uh, t was equal to 1 sorry 0 f was 0 and s was 0 <coughs> So basically what we're doing is we're just specifying a Bernoulli and, and just essentially saying how many coins was the, uh, how many times was the coin one value, how many times was the coin another value. So I'm interpreting each variable as a coin flip. But some of these coin flips are conditional. It's only when, say, two variables out of one value, the t, uh, the t distribution comes up. Go ahead. For your, um, for your, um parameter theta for the martini, shouldn't theta be the probability that's one? Because you have a zero above theta, isn't that? Isn't theta the parameter? Theta, right? Oh, yeah, 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 sorry. For all of them. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. Let's put a one and a zero here. <coughs> I mean, you could define it analogously, conversely, but here you have yeah, I, it, the order doesn't matter. I could I could flip it, but to, to be con to be consistent, let's 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 use one and zero. One, because essentially theta is equal to the probability that m equal one, and likewise, uh, beta one is equal to the probability of t equal one, given f equal zero comma s equal zero. Okay, these I can keep at zero and one. Okay. Likewise, I'm going to introduce a variable here, gamma, one minus gamma, one, and then I'm going to say that uh, gamma one is going to be equal to the probability of f equal one given m equals zero, and then gamma two at the bottom is going to be equal to the probability of f equal one when m is equal to uh, one. Okay. And I'm writing them as theta and one minus theta, alpha one minus alpha, beta one minus beta, because probability sum to one in the rows. That's the definition of the conditional probability. Okay, so if you sum over rows, you should get one. And, and likewise, I would call this beta two, beta three, beta four, and because everything must sum to one, this must be one minus beta one, one minus beta, uh, one minus beta four. Okay. So, just using Bernoulli distributions, I can specify all the Bernoulli distributions in the graph. So now, how do we learn them? Let's look at uh, one case. So let's start with the first one, p of m given theta. Okay. It's theta to the power of the number of times m was 1. How many times is m equal to 1? 4. And then 1 minus theta, the number of times m was 0, which is 1. That's it. That's our Bernoulli distribution for m. Now we do the next one, which is s. p of s and the parameter we call alpha. Alpha is just the name. Um, and so we have alpha, 1 minus alpha. How many times is s equal to 1? 2. Um, let's now look at the next one, which is P of F given M. And so first we need to learn P of F given M equals zero, comma gamma <coughs> gamma one is the parameter. And that's just equal to gamma one times one minus gamma one. And this one is now where it gets interesting. 
because I'm looking at how many times is f equal to 0 when m is also equal to 0. And the answer is one time. Now, how many times is f equal to 1 when m is 0? Zero times. Okay. So what's the probability of f being 1 when m is 0? It's 0, because <coughs> you, you never observed it. So in a frequentist setting, this makes sense. If you've never observed f equals 0 when m was 0, that means it will never be 0. Okay. So basically saying that if, if you don't go to, if you don't drink a martini, you'll never end up at Fritz. <laughs> and then the probability of f given m equal 1 comma gamma 2 is equal gamma 2 times 1 minus gamma 2. And now we do the same calculation. We count. How many, when m is equal to 1, how many times is f equal to 1? 3. <coughs> and then it's 0 one time. Um, and then you can do probability of, um, uh, what was the other variable? t. t <coughs> given f equals 0 comma s equals 0. And then I think the parameter we chose was beta 1. So we do the same thing. It's beta 1 times 1 minus beta 1. And then how many times? Let's look at when f and s are both 0. One. So that's this case here. <coughs> and so we get it 0 once. And it's never 1. Okay. And then you can do the other three cases. So we can specify all the distributions. And now we have the probability of data given the model. Because we know, according to this graph here, that the distribution p of t and m and s and f is equal to, according to this graph, the probability of the children given the parents. So it's probability of t given f and s times probability of f given m times p of m times p of s. And for simplicity, I dropped the parameters, because otherwise that expression would be very long if I wrote all those alphas and betas. Okay, but the graph factorizes. I now have expressions for all the individual probabilities. So now I have the joint the probability of all the data, given the, those parameters. Now, how do we learn the parameters? Uh, we use maximum likelihood, so theta maximum likelihood is just the number of ones divided by the number of tries or the number of measurements. <coughs> and so in this case, it's just 4 divided by 5. Um, alpha maximum likelihood, um, same calculation, so it's the number of times it was 1 divided by the number of tries, so it's 2 divided by 5. Um, gamma 1 is 0, because it's 0 divided by 1. Okay. Um, beta 1 is also 0. And so if we do this, we can get all the parameters. And once you know the parameters, you can just fill in all those tables. And now, now you know where those numbers came from. Okay. And typically, that's where the numbers come from. You first have data, you observe data, and then you just use maximum likelihood or base to fill in those tables. And once you have filled in the tables, 
Um, then you do what we did before. We do inference. We compute things like what's the probability of Martini given Fritz and so on. So, and we use conditional independence and all of those things that we did before. Um, what a Bayesian does, um, let's say for example we picked a distribution of alpha um, and let's say studying, I, you know, I really believe you guys are good students based on how you put your hands up and so I have a prior on S or on alpha and my prior on alpha will be equal to a beta um, 10 comma 1. So a beta 10 comma 1 basically says with very high probability you, you will be studying. So uh, it's, it's proportional to alpha to the 10 minus 1. Sorry. Oh yeah. alpha to the time minus 1 times 1 minus alpha to the 1 minus 1. Okay. And that's just equal to alpha to the 9 times 1 minus alpha to the 0. And of course if I plot that, that kind of looks like something like this. So it's saying, I, I really believe with high probability that you will be studying tonight. And then if I want, given the data, P of alpha, um, given um, the data that I've observed, which in this case is just of S, 1 to 5, is equal to the probability of S, 1 to 5, given alpha times P of alpha and if we look at P of S and by the way this should have been S 1 to 5 because it's all the observations but I dropped the index just to keep the notation a bit more simple um, and so that's just alpha to the 2 times 1 minus alpha to the 3 and then I plug in the prior which is um, and I'm going to do this to up to proportionality. If I plug in the prior, alpha to the 9, 1 minus alpha to the 0. And so this is going to give me something that's alpha to the 11 um, times 1 minus alpha to the 3. So that means that the, the mean, <coughs> the, the summary, for example, alpha bar, if I wanted to fill in those tables with the means, um, I would use, whoa, that was cool. <laughs> 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 that was. Windows tab. Um, it's the expectation of alpha given the observations of S. And in this case, it's just 11 divided by 11 plus 3, uh, which is equal to 11 divided by 14. Which is, what's that roughly? 0.78. Around 0.7. Okay. And that's how a Bayesian would go about it. And I've done it for alpha, but you would do the same thing for theta and for gamma 1 and for beta 1 and beta 2. This is a very tedious exercise. Um, in, the, in the next homework, I will ask you to do this for one graph. Um, if you're in a practice already, um, start doing these, the rest. I've done a few, I'm going to ask you to do the rest and, um, and this is sort of good stuff for the tutorials. So Bulbox over there um, can go over the, to do this one by one. Once, um, once you have this, you can answer questions like this. Okay, because you have all the, all the tables, you fill in the parameters, and then you can answer questions like this. Here is a good exercise for you that I strongly uh, recommend you do because then you will have practiced everything about graphical models. Compute that answer. And the first person that computes that answer, um, the first person that publishes the right answer on the Google group to this question, and by the answer I just want the number. 
what that probability is. Get five extra marks for the midterm. Sorry, but the correct answer given. I'm just stopping you from going to Fritz tonight. <laughs> well, you, want, you have to specify <laughs> whether you want up. Bayesian learning or frequentist learning, and if you want Bayesian learning, oh. you have to specify the parameters. Frequentist. Otherwise, you're going to get. By maximum likelihood. Because okay. otherwise, you get a slide the on, the, on the website. What is the midterm going to be out of? Huh? <laughs> so your midterm becomes out of 105, basically, instead of 100 for the rest. And, and let's do 5 extra for... That actually is worse. If our midterm is out of 105, extra 5 is less. Whatever. I'm, once I've calculated your mark at the end, I'm going to give you another 5 okay. out, of, uh, yeah, out of 100. <laughs> um, I will put the slides on now. Thank you. Yeah, I need to do that to make it fair. The, but the lectures are already, will be available immediately after. You can watch the video. The videos are automatic. As soon as I stop, at 6 o'clock, the video is online, in case you want to beat the competition. Because I have office hours, so it's going to be a delay of one hour, <laughs> at least, before I. So, we could have also used a model that was like this, that said Martini, Fritz, um, what was it, thin S. So someone suggested, why not use this other model? Now, the factorization for this model is P of T given F and S times P of F given M times P of M times P of S. On the other hand, the factorization for the other model is P of T given F and S times P of F given M, P of M times P of S given M. So there are two different models. So what do you do? You learn both. Um, in this particular example, learning T given F and S will be the same. F given M will be the same. And M will be, learning P of M will be the same. So learning those first three tables is going to be basically the same work. So the work that you do for the model on the left, you can reuse for the model on the right. The only difference is in the model on the right, there's going to be an extra two by two table instead of being a one, two by one table. Because you're going to have P of S given M. You will learn those parameters by maximum likelihood on base. Now, given a new data set, so I can now give you a new data set that basically um, says um, M, F, S, T, um, and it basically says, I don't know, a martini, not Fritz, not study, and not thing. So I can now give you my data set. And after you compute all the parameters, you evaluate both models on that data set of two observations. Which model gives you higher probability, higher joint probability? That's the best model. That's the model you pick. 